Section 34 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hopeful Swan. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. Part 2, Chapter 10. After the settlement was thrown open in 1842, Mr. Andrew Petrie's office was of course abolished, and Colonel Barney and others, recognizing that gentleman's ability, endeavored to persuade him to return to Sydney and continue under the government there. However, taking an interest in Queensland, he preferred remaining where he was to try his luck in what he foresaw would become a flourishing colony. Therefore, he started business on his own account, contracting for government and other buildings, and here his engineering and architectural training stood him in good stead. In 1848, while on a trip to the Downs, Mr. Petrie caught Sandy Blight, which was prevalent at the time. His eyes got very bad, and though everything was tried to cure them, nothing seemed to work. Being an active man, he became impatient at the waste of time consequent, and though his wife begged him to await a while and rest, he insisted upon going to the doctors. Simple remedies and time, no doubt, would have worked the cure. The doctors in those early days were not as skillful as they are now. My father, then a boy of about seventeen years, remembers leading his father to the hospital which stood where the Supreme Court is now, and there they went in to the doctors to see what could be suggested, my grandfather saying, Whatever you do, don't cut anything. Oh, no, was the reply. But the boy saw one of them take up a small pair of tweezers and catching hold of the skin or scum which had formed over the site, he held it while the other cut through with another instrument. Then caustic was put in the eyes, and the doctors declared that though it would pain a little, everything would come right, and Mr. Petrie would be able to see. All the way home, however, the poor gentleman was in great pain, and that whole night through he walked his room in agony, and one of his eyes burst. Father could never forget that awful time afterwards, and to this day he thinks his father's sight may have been saved under different treatment. Some time after, when the pain had gone from his eyes, my grandfather was taken to Sydney to see if the doctors there could do any good. They told him that one eye was quite hopeless. The sight was gone altogether, but there might be some chance with the other. In the latter he always thought he could see a little glimmering, but nothing further ever came of it. It is a pitiful thing when a strong, active man loses his eyesight, when Mr. Andrew Petrie realized that he would never see again. His agony and suffering must have been frightful, for he could not become reconciled just at first. It was a sad, sad time for his wife, who had to comfort him and witness his struggle, helpless to effect a cure. He was only fifty years of age at the time, and had always been used to leading others, so that the eternal darkness facing him must naturally have been almost more than he could bear. Could he have known he was to live a blind man for twenty-four years, being nearly seventy-four at his death? However, in time it was wonderful how he managed. People marveled at his aptitude. He was always at work with his mind, my father says. I have seen him when tenders were called for erecting a building or bridge, etc., getting my brother John to explain the plans and read the specifications to him. Then he would take a slate, and with the forefinger of the left hand on the top of the slate, he wrote the cross, moving down his finger each time he finished a line until both sides were filled. He never crossed the lines and would state the quantity of timber required, the amount of nails, and everything else needful, or if it was something to be built of brick or stone, he was scarcely out in a brick, etc. 
Indeed, he was very seldom out in his reckoning. Father goes on to say that his father always rang the workman's bell at eight o'clock, then again at one and two and six. He gave all the men their orders for the day. He knew each by their step and called them by their names. To one drayman he would say to take so many loads of loam to the scene of action, and to another so much sand, lime, or bricks. And then the carpenters, blacksmiths, and sawyers got their orders. Going to the carpenter shop, he would feel the work being done all over, and knew at once if it was correct. They could not deceive him. In the same way he went to the blacksmiths and stonemasons, and I have heard the men say they would sooner see anyone coming into the shop to examine their work than father. They said if anything was wrong or not finished off properly, he would find it out by feeling, for he knew where a joint should be or a nail driven, and was never imposed upon, but would have things done properly at all costs. He always carried a walking stick, and at times would use it when displeased, but in a moment or two his temper was gone, and asking for a piece of board, he drew on it with chalk, the shape of the moulding or anything that they were making, explaining how it was to be done and all about it, telling them to be sure and work correctly. Mr. Andrew Petrie was led every day to all the buildings and other works under construction. He was never satisfied till he went the rounds to see what was required for the next day. His son, John, after a time had a pony broken in for him to save any walking, for he had a sore leg. Before leaving the old country his thigh was broken, while riding a young horse from his work in Edinburgh. The animal shied and ran him into a cab. The young fellow's leg got caught in the spokes of the wheel and was broken, and also the shin and side of the leg above the ankle was very much skinned and bruised. The broken part, thigh, was set and recovered, but the bruise on the leg would heal up and then break out again, and years afterwards, when his sight was gone, it was very bad at times. One could almost see the bone of this leg, father remarks, but my father would never lay up with it. Though you could see that it pained him sometimes very much, he would never give in. He had a great spirit as well as an active mind, and his memory was splendid. He often gave us his sons little things to do and remember, and though we perhaps forgot all about them, he never did, and would afterwards ask had we done such and such a thing. When I told him I'd forgotten, he would say the wretched tobacco smoke had taken all my brains away. A boy led the pony on which my father rode round to the different works in progress, and you would see him taken to a ladder leaning on a two-story building, up which he would climb just as though he could see. Getting to the top and on to a plank, he would poke about with his stick on the sides and all along the plank, then all over the building, feeling with it the different parts of the work, and all the men had to do was to tell him what portion of the building he was on, and he seemed to know where each piece of timber should be fixed, and where every joint should be. It was wonderful to see him going over a building. He had a grand head, much better than any of us, his sons. His leg never got well, though it healed up somewhat before his death. He was very independent with regard to this leg, and dressed, washed, and bandaged it himself night and morning, seldom allowing anyone else to touch it. In the same year in which Mr. Andrew Petrie lost his eyesight, 1848, his son Walter was drowned in the one-time creek from which Creek Street now takes its name. In those early days Mr. Petrie ran a couple of punts, one of which was employed in carrying stone, used for buildings, from the hard stone quarry at Kangaroo Point, also sand and shells from the bay for lime-making. The other journeyed to Ipswich with Fleur, etc., for Walter Gray's store, and brought back tallow and bales of wool. On one occasion the latter was loaded and ready to start, but lay at anchor opposite Kangaroo Point, waiting for the tide, 
which would not suit till eight o'clock, and Walter Petrie, a boy of twenty-two, intended making the trip in charge of the boat, as the headman was ill, and had gone down the township before the hour of departure to visit some friends and get some tobacco. When eight o'clock came round, however, there was no sign of the young fellow, and one of the crew, former prisoners on board, wondering what he should do, went ashore at last to ask instructions. Mr. Petrie started off at this to look for his son, saying to Tom to come along and they would find him. Father remembers well leading his blind father to a number of different places, and at last he came to a friend who said a young fellow had been there some hours previously, leaving with the intention of going to the boat. That night no trace was found. Next morning Mrs. Petrie, with one of those unexplained insights into the unseen, said that her son would never be found alive, for he was drowned down in the creek, and she pointed her hand as she spoke. Her remark was, however, made light of, the hearers little suspecting how true it was, the boy being a splendid swimmer. In the meantime, a story had been started, born quickly like a bubble, as empty tales are at those times, that the young fellow had run away. The boat waiting to start was sent off, and Tom took his brother's place. Whether it was because of his mother's remark he does not know, but all the time the boy had the same strange feeling that water was drowned. And going up the river, everything he saw floating gave him a turn. At that time, R.G. Smith's boiling down works had opened under Bremer, and after entering that river, the boat's party came upon a dead body floating a little way ahead. I thought it was him, says my father, and I nearly dropped. But when we got up to it, it was a dead sheep with the wool all off floating in the water. Then when we got to Ipswich, I was told that my brother had been found drowned in the creek at Brisbane on the same day as I had seen the sheep. Strange but true is the following, which illustrates still further the strong feeling which Mrs. Petrie had with regard to her son's disappearance. In those days a small scrub grew on the north bank of the creek, just behind where the commercial bank is now, at the corner of Queen and Creek Streets. Before any trace was found of the missing lad, two men were sent by Mr. Petrie to this scrub for vines for binding up shingles, which were always bound, so then in bundles the vines being twisted into the shape of hoops. And Mrs. Petrie, hearing the order, she had never been out of the house all this time, called after them, You will find my poor boy down there in the creek, and then she persisted in watching the man, for from the doorway the creek could be seen. Her daughter stayed by her side, seeking to draw her away, but the poor lady was in such a dazed condition that she seemed unable to think of anything but her lost son. She watched as the man reached the creek, then noticing them pause and draw back. They have found him now, she said. The man returned and asked for Mr. Petrie. Why do you ask that, she said. I know what has brought you. You have found my boy. All the time she was unable to weep, and they had to take her away to another part of the house. Mr. Petrie himself had discredited the idea of drowning, saying Walter was too good a swimmer, and now the shock seemed to come to him twofold. Pitiful it must have been to see the poor blind gentleman going to his wife's side as he did when he heard the truth, and the body having been in the water, he could not even have the comfort of feeling his son for the last time, the bonny boy who was a favourite with all. It was found afterwards that the young fellow had gone to cross the bridge, or rather apology for one, which spanned the creek opposite to where Campbell's warehouse is now, and the logs being wet, for it had been raining, he slipped and fell. The bridge was originally composed of three long logs put across the creek, then slabs on top and dirt covering all, but at this time the dirt had fallen off and also nearly all the slabs lay beneath in the mud. As the young fellow crossed to take the shortcut to the boat, simply as such accidents happen, 
he slipped in the dark, though he may have crossed safely a hundred other times, and falling head foremost onto the slabs, it was slow tide, he was stunned and lay unconscious. Indeed, from the examination afterwards, it was said his neck was broken. However, he lay there all alone in the dark while it sought for him in other places, and the water which knew him so well, and in which he had learned to swim, rose slowly and lapped against the stalwart young form as though to rouse it. Then, gaining no answer and growing bolder, the tide lifted and carried the lad up the creek to where he was afterwards found. Of all Andrew Petrie's children, Walter was the only fair one with blue eyes, and he was said to be exceedingly handsome. Grandfather himself was fair, but my grandmother, who was a Cuthbertson, was dark and a very big woman. They thought it wisest not to let her see her dead son, but she would not be comforted otherwise, and the sight proved too much. Dad is not my boy, she insisted, and then the mother lost consciousness. It was a very peculiar coincidence, but nine years afterwards, at the end of 1857, in the same creek, another Walter, a little son of John Petrie, was drowned, the first Walter being 22 years, while the second was a baby of 22 months. The child's accident also happened at a broken bridge, though it was further up the stream. In fact, it stood in the present Queen Street, near where Shaw's iron mongery shop used to be now occupied by russell wilkins the boy wandered off from his nurse and she being sent to seek him came upon the little chap drowned in the creek the alarm was given and the body was recovered quickly but life was extinct in that part of water was only five or six feet deep walter petrie as i have said was only twenty-two years of age when he met his death and he was an exceptionally strong young fellow. His brother Tom says of him, I have seen Walter take two hundred pound bags of fleur, one under each arm, and walk by a plank on board a punt with them. Also many a time, in my presence, has he taken a blacksmith's sledgehammer by the handle and held it out at arm's length. He was a splendid swimmer, learning the art with his brothers, and not many yards from where... He fell, and had the water been high when he attempted to cross the logs, all would have been well. Before his death, Walter Petrie used, with his brother John, to row a great deal in the early boat races. The sport was very different then to what it is now. The boats were heavy and ungainly, and the races were consequently won by sheer strength. Boats after the style of a present-day ferry boat were used for one occupant, and both Walter and John won many of these single-handed races. Then together they pulled in the whale boat e events with equal success, their boat being called the Lucy Long. Whale boats held five oarsmen always, and another man who stood up and used the steer oar, holding it in his left hand, while with his right he assisted the stroke. Such races would look odd in these days, of course, but my father says a whaleboat race was well worth watching. The men all kept good time, feathering their oars alike and so on. The course taken was from the colonial stores, Queen's Wharf, down to the garden point, where a buoy was anchored, then round the buoy and back to the point on South Brisbane, Brisbane above the present commercial shed then called Wormsley Point, after a sawyer who used to cut timber there. Another boy was anchored here, and the course continued round it, then back home to the wharf. When John Petrie was pulling in these races, he acted as stroke. By way of variety, what was called a dinghy race was indulged in. It was great fun. The dinghy only held one man, of course, and John Petrie was very often chosen because of his aptitude. He was allowed so many yards start, and the idea was that the bowman in the whaleboat following had to catch him within a certain length of time, about twelve minutes. When the whaleboat got close to the dinghy, the latter would spin round like a top, 
and the big boat lost ground in turning after it, and so they went on until, if the whale boat got too near, the pursued man jumped overboard and dived beneath his opponent's boat. Bo followed after, diving also, but when John Petrie was in the race, he was seldom caught before time was up, as he was a grand swimmer and diver in those days, and very few could catch him in the water. Of course, there was no bridge across the river then. Being a good deal younger, my father was out of these races, but he witnessed them nevertheless. Another exciting event to remember in this connection was a race between two lots of natives. Each crew occupied a whaleboat, and the prize was a bag of fleur and some tea and sugar. It was a splendid race and well pulled, the winners who were Amity Point Blacks being the others Brisbane tribe by a length. The successful crew were fine, big, strong men and good pullers, having had more practice than their Brisbane brethren, as they mostly had belonged to the pilot's boat's crew. That night in camp there was much feasting, the prize being greatly appreciated. End of part two, chapter ten, recording by Hope Force One. Part two, chapter eleven of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, recorded by his daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As an instance of the great changes which have taken place in Brisbane in even less than one lifetime, it is interesting to follow my father's experiences of the way in which shells and coral for lime-making were obtained when he was a boy. As already mentioned, a punt did the carting from the bay, and as a protection to them from the blacks, Tom was sent with the crew for well, being so well known among the darkies, the lad was a safeguard to anyone in his company. The shells used were obtained from the sandy point on the humpy bong side of the mouth of the Pine River, where they were plentiful then in the required dry, dead state. And this point the blacks called Kulakan, Pelican, because at low water... The bank there was crowded with pelicans. Four men, besides my father, manned the boat, and they went with the ebb down the river, anchoring at the mouth till the tide turned again and came up some two feet, thus enabling the party to surmount the difficulty of sandbanks. Planks were fixed along each side of the punt, so that the men could walk from end to end, and each man had a long, light pole with which to shove the boat along. They kept in as close to the shore as was possible, and so, with the help of the tide, got slowly along past where Sandgate is now, onwards to the mouth of the pine, farther steering. Four baskets made by old Bribey, the basket maker, also two or three rakes to gather together the shells, formed part of the punt's outward going cargo, and two men would fill the baskets while the remaining pair carried them into the water, dipping them up and down to rid the shells of all sand. The punt was left dry on the beach as the water receded, but the tide coming up again would float her when she was laden. Sometimes natives were present and they helped with the work, their payment being tobacco and flour. Almost always the homeward start was made at night. As it was calmer then and as the tide rose, the men poled away along the shore till they got into the river, the tide carrying them there. The outgoing journey was commenced at night, too, generally. Coral for the lime-making was obtained in much the same way from King Island, or Wynnum, breadfruit, as the blacks called it then. 
The punt was taken through the boat passage and kept close to the land all the way, being poled along the shore as before in the night hours, then over to the island. These punts held big loads, but later their place was taken by a cutter Mr. Petrie had built for the purpose and for carrying oysters from the oyster banks for the lime. Lime burning was carried out at Petrie's Bight, and there also the cutter was built. When writing of the habits of the Aborigines, I have mentioned how my father as a youngster used to spend hours day after day in the water with the black boys, diving as amusement for white bones and pebbles. This made him very dexterous, and so whenever there was a difficult water drop in those days, he was in great request. The first thing he remembers tackling was a large steam boiler, which had sunk in a pump during the night of the wharf where Thomas Brown and Sons Warehouse is now. The punt lay on a slant, one end being some twenty feet beneath the water, and the other six feet, and my father had to try to see where a chain could be got under the boiler to rise it. He went down in the chain, which was fastened to another large punt on the surface, and this is his description of the experience. Quote, the water was very clear, and I could see as well as if out of it. Coming to the lower end, after going along holding to the boiler, I let go to come up, and although I could see the light above, thought I would never reach the surface, and when I did arrive there was pretty well out of breath. After a rest, I started down again, taking with me a small line by which to pull the chain under the boiler. I succeeded in getting the line under and came back along the chain, making sure that I would get up this time all right. The men in the punt above pulled on the line and then I went down again and pushed the chain under and they pulled again and were successful in getting it through. The chains were fastened to the punt above during low water, so of course, as she rose with the tide, the punt beneath was lifted too. End quote. Another water job was undertaken after a large flood, which carried away what was then Harris's Wharf in the present Short Street, next to where Pettigrew's Mill stood. The wharf was taken a good many yards into the river and it had to be raised. So a punt was put alongside with sheer legs attached to hoist the logs. And Father went down time after time and put a chain round one by one. And he also prized them asunder with a crowbar. A man called Tom Collins, a bricklayer, assisted by sitting astride a log in the water and he handed the crowbar and chain as they were wanted, thus saving a lot of swimming on the young fellow's part. The man himself could not swim, but, says my father, quote, he was a good worker, they're very fond of his nip. At this time, it was rather cold to be in the water every day, and the work went on for some two months. So they used to give Collins a glass of grog each morning before work, and then again when he knocked off. One day, however, this little attention was neglected, and as it happened to be extra cold, Collins informed me that he would make them give him his usual. So crawling along the log to the shore, he tumbled off into the mud. Then picking himself up and putting his tongue out at me, scrambled up the bank and into the store. Up the stairs he went shivering and shaking, the mud and water dripping from him, and when they saw him there, For glory's sake, go down out of this. See what a mess you're making. But the dirty, wet object only shivered and shook the more, and making his teeth chatter, he gasped, I can't go till you give me a glass of grog. 
To get him out of their sight was all they thought of, so he triumphantly returned to me, wagging his tongue, and carefully fondling a bottle of gin under his arm. I'll be all right now, he said, and be able to hold the bar fine and steady. End quote. Collins, sitting there on the log in the water, dangling his legs, must have cut rather a comical figure, and people who came and paused to look on would call to ask what he was doing. Oh, I'm holding a lamp under the water so that the chap below can see to prise some logs apart, would be his reply. Poor Collins, his fondness for a nip, ended his days. For many years after he sat there on the log, he was found one day quite dead on the bank of the Bremer River, his head in the water, and it was supposed that being drunk he lay down to try and get a drink, failing miserably in the attempt to rise again. If the water had been clear and warm during this work, things would have been much more pleasant. But Father says it was full of floating dead fish after the flood, and to come up and strike one with his face was anything but nice. At this time he bore a ring made on the Bendigo diggings from pure gold he had found there himself. And one day, while working in the water, a chain caught this ring and knocked it off his finger. He dived, but could not find it, being unable to see in the muddy water, so a day or two afterwards got a couple of blacks to come along and try. They were also unsuccessful, though trying a long time, so the ring was given up for lost. However, on the Saturday afternoon, when work was done, my father, feeling sad about the ring, because of its associations, said to Collins, I will try once more for that ring. The water is low and I know just where it dropped. With that, in he jumped, and the first thing he felt when touching the bottom was the ring on a stone. The young fellow's delight can be imagined. This reads somewhat like romance, but it's all quite true, and one of my father's daughters now wears the ring, he having had it cut to fit her finger. To go further with its history, I may add, the ring was lost a second time. For months it lay on a lawn, and when hope was given up, it caught one day on the prongs of a rake a gardener was wielding. Yet another piece of waterwork will I mention. This time the scene was the Bremer River, and the first Roman Catholic church was being erected at Ipswich. A punt laden with shingles and freestone for the building sank one night when only about twenty yards from the bank, having sprung a leak. Father was sent up with two natives to do the diving. And he first of all went down to find out how the punt lay so that he could fix the position of the floating punt above. Then poles were put down to enable the divers to judge where to come up safely, the water being muddy, and they took it in turns to get the shingles up with the help of sheer legs. This did not take much time, but the stones were more troublesome. They were heavy. Some of them my father could not move when on land, but beneath the water could lift an end and so get the sling fixed. One day, he says, one of the darkies in coming up got under the floating punt, and you could hear him bump, bump on the bottom. We thought it was a case with him, but he bumped all along the bottom of the punt till he got to the end, then came up. We caught him and pulled him out, and he was nearly done for, but soon recovered. However, nothing would induce the poor fellow to go into the water again, so the job had to be finished without him. End of Part 2, Chapter 11 
Part 2, Chapter 12 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, dating from 1837, recorded by his daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, Part 2, Chapter 12. Mr. Andrew Petrie had several, quote, old hands, unquote, who had served their time and were free working for him in different ways. One cranky Tom was quite a character and would have served as material for a child's dickens. He used to do odd jobs such as cutting firewood, loading drays, etc. And the poor man was not quite in possession of his senses in all things. He would never sleep in a bed, but would camp beside the kitchen fire, or if a lime kill were burning there, for a certainty would he be found rolled up in a blanket, surrounded by dogs. When asked, Tom, what were you sent out to this country for? He invariably answered for pulling the tail of a donkey and beating him with the bloody end of it. One day a dray loaded with timber entered the yard, and the drayman called to Cranky Tom to chock the wheel. The stupid man, instead of getting a stone or stick, ran and used his foot as a stop, but it quickly came out again, and its owner danced about, crying, Oh, my country, what have I suffered for you? The wheel had given him a nasty squeeze, but did not go over the foot. Another time, one Sunday morning, when Jimmy Porter, one of the prentice boys, got up to light the fire and put the kettle on, he was surprised to find all the kitchen utensils gone. Pots, pans, kettle, cups and saucers, plates, knives, everything. Even the long iron rake for the ashes. Before the family could breakfast, a messenger had to be sent across for fresh things to the general store then kept at Kangaroo Point by a man called Davidson. Cranky Tom was suspected of having hidden the utensils, but he could not be found anywhere about the place, so a policeman's help was sought. Father, boy-like, accompanied the bobby, and he remembered how they went past Petrie's Bite and as far as to where the Union Hotel stands now in the valley, and there they came upon Cranky Tom sitting on the roadside laughing and looking quite pleased with himself, his trousers all soiled with pot black. The policeman said to him, Well, Tom, how did you get all that black stuff on your trousers? I don't know. Why did you take all those things out from Mr. Petrie's kitchen, Tom? I done it for a change. Where did you put them? I don't know. After some more, well, I will have to take you to the lock-up. And the handcuffs are put on. Going along, the poor fellow began twisting the irons about on his wrists, then suddenly, exploding with laughter, he said, Oh, my country, they don't fit. The police magistrate could get nothing further from Tom than I'd done it for a change. So in the end he was declared to be insane, and there being no asylum in Queensland, was sent to Sydney. The kitchen utensil's hiding place was discovered in this wise. The ferryman crossing the river came upon a couple of the articles floating, so it was at once thought that the whole lot had been thrown into the water, and an old black fellow, Ben Tobin, a head Brisbane man, was got to pick up Cranky Tom's tracks, which he did very soon and some of the things were discovered by him diving. They had been thrown in just where the steamer from Humpy Bong now lands her passengers. Another man who worked at the same time as Cranky Tom was Deaf Mickey, a small man who was also half silly like Tom. Whenever he got his wages on the Saturday, he would go to the store and buy a week's supply of rations, then repair to the old windmill as it was then called, being in disuse, and camped there till his fare ran out. Every day between meals he walked some two hundred yards from the mill into the bush, backwards and forwards, speaking to himself and squaring up to a gum tree which stood at the end of his walk, putting up his fists as though to fight it, 
talking all the time. He made quite a plain beaten track to the tree, and go where you liked, says my father, you would see Mickey walking up and down and biting with the gum tree. Mickey had a quart pot and pint for his tea, and also a bag to hold his rations. When the latter were finished, he would go back to his master and say, Be the Lord, I have been walking about this long time looking for work and can't get any. Please would you give me a job? Then he would work again for another week. He was not a bad worker, but could never be depended on for more than a fortnight at a time before he was off again to fight the trees. It was as good as a play, my father says, to see Mickey and cranky Tom cross-cutting a log. Many a time he watched the pair. The latter would call, Mickey, pull the saw, you're not pulling it, and laugh at him. His companion would stare with not a smile on his face, then say, I think you're cranky. And Tom would reply, Oh, my country, I think you're gone in the head. You can't hear. Father would sometimes watch the two unseen, and sometimes, from pure devilment, would egg them on to one another. Once Mickey was sent to Morton Island to work at a building there. It was thought that, being away from stores, he would keep on longer. However, at the end of a fortnight he took it into his head to walk to Sydney, and disappeared for that purpose. No one troubled over him, all feeling sure that he would turn up again when the rations he had taken were finished. It was said that in a week's time he came back, having evidently walked about the island, and going to his former employer said, Be the Lord, I have been walking all over the country looking for work and can't find any. Please will you give me a job? He was put to work, but the manager took the first opportunity of sending him back to Brisbane, fearing something might happen to the man when he took it into his head to go off again. Poor Mickey's end was also the asylum. I think, says my father, that both deaf Mickey and cranky Tom had been knocked silly in Logan's time with the punishment they got in those days. They both seemed harmless, poor chaps. There is much which is indeed pathetic in this world, mixed side by side with the comical. Another of these old hands was a man called Daly, who was fond of going on the spree. One night the Petrie boys found this man very far gone lying in the yard. So what did they do, after some discussion, but go to the carpenter shop and get a coffin? And this they carried to Daly and to put him in it. In the morning the young jokers got up early to see the fun, and going to where they had left the coffin, found the man sitting up in his gruesome bed talking to himself. They heard him say before they burst out laughing and roused his anger, Oh, Henny, I wonder how long I've been buried. Henny was a favourite word with him, and the boys called him nothing else. Many a bit of fun they had with this man. At another time they nearly frightened him out of his senses by stuffing his old clothes with shavings and hanging the figure to a beam in the doorway. Coming home half drunk, Henny thought, of course, someone had committed suicide, and he bolted. The boys had made the figure most natural-looking with boots and hats and all complete. Strange things happened in those days. Old Bob, a sawyer, one-time convict or old hand, lived at Kangaroo Point with his wife. They had no children. The wife used to go on the spree now and then. One day she was the worse for drink near her home and making a great noise, so two policemen secured her to take her to the lock-up. A fairy punt was pulled across the river by a rope in those days, and the police got the woman into this punt to take her to the north side. When about to land, the man who held Mrs. Bob let go to hold the rope, and the woman immediately jumped over into the water. However, she was dragged back again and lay down in the punt a wet heap, saying, If you want to take me to the lock-up, you will have to carry me. At the devil of foot will I walk. The instruments of the law were compelled to take her at her word and carry her ashore. 
and finding her still obstinate, one of them went up to Mr. Andrew Petrie's for a wheelbarrow. Picture the scene. The old woman was lifted into the barrow, then one man held her while the other wheeled, and there she sat blessing the police and calling them all manner of nice names, and following up this procession, which wended its way up the road, which is now Queen Street, came boys and men laughing and having great fun, my father among them. Can one imagine such a procession now in Queen Street? The policemen took turns to hold and to wheel, and so they went on till they got to about where the town hall is now, to the lock-up, and then the three, the victim and the victimised, disappeared from the eyes of the crowd, Mrs. Bob being detained some twenty-four hours for being, quote, jolly. Sometime after this event, Bob made a bargain with Bill, another sawyer. He handed over his wife to Bill in exchange for a horse and dray. So Bill had someone to cook and wash for him, while Bob had a horse and dray. Prehistoric times, surely. All went well for some months. Then Bill came to Bob, who was carting wood and water for sale, and told him he wanted his property back again. Bob refused flatly, saying it was a fair bargain, and the end of it was that he was summoned to court. My father remembers the case well. The court was held in a room in the old government building, a little above the old archway that stood then in Queen Street. After the evidence was taken on both sides, the police magistrate said that Bob had to give up the horse and dray and take his wife back. Your Worship, Bob said to him, I don't think it's right that I should have to give up the horse and dray, as it was a fair, honest bargain. The magistrate replied, Man, you are not allowed to sell your wife, and you must do as I say. So it was done. And strange to relate, the pair seemed to live very happily together for years after this. A kinder and cleaner woman, one could meet nowhere when away from drink, and no one who called a Bob's Humpy was allowed to pass without a meal. She was a good cook, and an excellent washerwoman, and could do up shirts with anyone. However, the curse of drink on both sides told its tale, and when old age came, the couple had to repair to Dunwich, where they died some years back, taking their story with them. Before leaving these days, I should like to mention a peculiar habit the old hands, sawyers, etc., had when boiling their tea in the bush. There were no billies then, but court pots were used, and invariably two little sticks were placed crosswise across the pot. This was done to draw the tea, they said, and the men saw nothing strange in the habit. Milton Graveyard, where Grandfather Petrie was buried, seems a thing of the far past now, but there was a cemetery older still. It was on the opposite side of the street to where the coal chutes are now at Troma Street Station. There the prisoners and soldiers were buried. Before that again, North Quay had been used, but not sufficiently to be called a cemetery. When the place at Roma Street was disused, four or five men were set to dig up the graves, and the bones were moved to Milton. One of these men, his companions related afterwards, a little stout Irishman, coming to a coffin lid, raised it, and exposure to the air caused an old grey cap on the skeleton to fall to pieces. Throwing up his hands, the frightened Pat exclaimed as he recovered himself, My good soul, keep your cap on. I'm a poor man like yourself. This Pat, it was said, used to take the coffin boards home to his cottage in the valley, and with them he put up a fine skillion. The boards were cedar and quite sound, although some had been underground for a number of years. And so the big place we now call the valley had its beginning. List of places, names, plants and trees with a few specimens of Aboriginal vocabulary. Place Marumba, T. Petrie's homestead, native name Marumba, native meaning good. Place North Pine Kippering near Blacksmiths, 
native name Nindo and Genero, native meaning leech sitting down. Place portion of North Pine River near Railway Bridge, native name Mundin, native meaning fishing net. Place small island, Tom Petrie's, below Marumba, native name Gompu. Place site of a former lagoon in Paddock near Gatekeepers, North Pine, native name Yimbung, native meaning bulrush. Place creek below Marumba, native name Yibri, native meaning put or laid down. Place spring below Imber Pine, North Pine, native name Barimpa, native meaning present place. Place Pocketin River above Imber Pine, native name Bungil, native meaning grass. Place Big Hill near Petrie's Pocket, native name Mudlow Mudlow, native meaning stone stone. Place Cottage Hill, mouth of pine, Petrie's Pocket, Native name Andorba. Place Sandy Point, mouth of pine, north side. Native name Kulukan. Native meaning pelican. Place Scots Point, Humpybong. Native name Bandamadu. Native meaning white clay, getting it. Place another point, Humpybong. Native name Warun. Place Redcliffe, part of. Native name Cowan Cowan, native meaning blood red like blood. Redcliffe part of native name Yura, native meaning spotted gum. Place Kabulcha, native name Kabultor, native meaning place of carpet snakes. Place Kabulcha Bribe dialect, native name Wongadum, native meaning same meaning. Place Narangba, Native name Narangba, native meaning small place. Place Stony Creek Narangba, native name Bulba. Place Nuram Nuram Creek, native name Nuram Nuram, native meaning wart wart. Place two small mountains above Delaney's, native name Bulburum. Place Sidling Creek, native name Kawongba. Place Mount Samson, native name Burum. Native meaning wind. Place Samson Vale, native name Tukawampa. Place Rush Creek, native name Bagheera. Place Browns Creek, native name Tugui. Place Samford, native name Kupitabin, native meaning from Kupi and Opossum. Place D.L. Browns Land, Samford, native name Karandukamari. Place Straight Stretch of Water and Nogra near Salyards, native name Buyuba, native meaning leg, shin. Place Mount Kutha, native name Kuta, native meaning dark, native honey. Place Muggle Creek, native name Muggle, native meaning large water lizard. Place Tawong near railway station, native name Bunaraba, Place Bendin River below Indurapilly Bridge, native name Tuong, native meaning black goat sucker, bird. Place Site of Railway Bridge Indurapilly, native name Mibapa. Place Site of Regatta Hotel Tuong, native name Juai Joy. Place Indurapilly should be Yindurapilly. Place Yurongapilly should be Yurongpilly, native meaning rain coming. Place West End, native name Karilpa, native meaning place for rats. Place Wollongabba should be Wollongkopa. Place Mount Cotton near Mount Petrie, native name Tungipin, native meaning West Wind. Place Mount Gravat, native name Kukamabul. Place Norman Creek, native name Kulpuram. Place Hemant, Wynnum dialect, native name Komwa Mandado, native meaning place for curlew. Place Mount Hant, Logan dialect, native name Giranguba, native meaning opossum. Place Queensport, native name Marira. Place Pinkenbar, native name Dumbin. Place New Farm, native name Pinkenbar, native meaning place of the land tortoise. Place White's Hill, 
native name Balimba. Place Balimba, native name Tugulawa, native meaning shape of heart, indicating river bend at that spot. Place Buradaban, native name Buradaban, native meaning place of oaks. Place Wulluwin should be Kuluwin. Place Hill, Garrick's House, Bowen Bridge Road, native name Gilbumpa. Place Exhibition and Hospital, native name Wulan, native meaning brim, fish. Place Ashgrove, native name Kalandaban. Place Observatory, native name Will Winpa. Place Breakfast Creek, native name Yawagara. Place Newstead, native name Karakara and Pinbili. Place Breakfast Creek near Railway Bridge, native name Barambin. Place Boggy Creek Eagle Farm, native name Tunkaibu. Place Petrie's Bight, native name Tumamum. Place Nanda, native name Nanda, native meaning chain of waterholes. Place Nanda Racecourse, native name Gilwumpa. Place Nanda, site of former German mission, native name Tumbul. Place Sandgate, native name Wara, native meaning open sheet of water or river. Place Nudgy, native name Mergen Mergen. Place Tingalpa, native name Timgalpa, native meaning place of fat. Place Amity Point, native name Pulan. Place Swan Bay, native name Widji Widji P. Place Kanaipa, native name Kanaipa. Place St. Helena, native name Nogun. Place Mud Island, native name Bangamba. Place Green Island, native name Milwapa. Place Strabrook Island, near South Passage, native name Dumba. Place Cape Morton, native name Kanemba. Place Winham, native name Winham, native meaning breadfruit. Place Dunwich, native name Gumpy. Place Morton Island, native name Mulgumpin. Place Manly, native name Nalo. Place Kuchimadlo Island, native name Kuchimadlo, native meaning red stone. Place Ipswich, native name Tulmo. Place Gudna, native name Gudna, native meaning dung. Place Brisbane, garden point from the bridge round to Creek Street, taking in the settlement, native name Mianjin. Place Gimpy, wide bay dialect, native name Gimpy, native meaning stinging tree. Place Pialba, wide bay dialect, native name Pilba, Native meaning butcher bird. Place Noosa Head. Native name Wantima. Native meaning rising or climbing up. Place Portion of Scrub at Malula. Native name Jippy. Native meaning bird. Maruchi dialect. Place Nambor. Native name Nambor. Native meaning tea tree bark. Place Badaram Mountain. Native name Badaram. Native meaning honeysuckle. Place Yandina. Native name Yandina. Native meaning small place of water. Place Torbal Point. Native name Ningi Ningi. Native meaning oysters. Bribe Island Passage. Place White Patch. Native name Tarangiri. Native meaning leg. Place Oyster Camp Reserve. Native name Banya. Place Long Island, native name Nulu, native meaning small. Place Glass Mountain Creek, native name Baki Bomen, native meaning stone standing up. Place Kuchin Creek, native name Kuchi, native meaning red paint. Glass House Mountains. 1. Biwa, up in the sky, Brisbane dialect. 2. Bibaram, Parrot, Maruchi dialect. Ningun Barung, neck crooked, Brisbane dialect, or Kundawarum, neck crooked, Maruchi dialect. Chibukaran, squirrel biting, Brisbane dialect. Tunabulabula, mountain two, Maruchi dialect. Guinea, lawyer cane, Maruchi dialect. 
tree or plant. Bunya pine, native name Bunyi, scientific name Arcaria bidwillii. Tree or plant pine, similar to New Zealand kari, native name Dandarum, scientific name Agatus robusta. Plant cypress pine, native name Burugari, scientific name Calitris columnularis. Plant Morton Bay pine, native name Combacho, scientific name Aracaria cunninghamii. Plant red ironbark, native name Bigar, scientific name Eucalyptus siderifolia. Plant ironbark narrow-leaved, native name Tandur, scientific name Eucalyptus crebra. Plant blue gum, native name Mungar, scientific name Eucalyptus teriticornis. Plant spotted gum, native name Nura, scientific name Eucalyptus macalata. Plant stringy barks, native name Dura, scientific name Eucalyptus acmenioides. Plant bloodwood, native name Buna, scientific name Eucalyptus corimbosa. Plant swamp mahogany, native name Bolochu, scientific name Tristania suaviolens. Plant fig box, native name Tapalpala, scientific name Tristania conferta. Plant cedar, red, native name Mamin, scientific name Cedra tuna. Plant Morton Bay chestnut, native name Mai, scientific name Castanospermum australe. Plant Morton Bay ash, native name Curan, scientific name Eucalyptus tessellaris. Plant she oak, native name Bili, scientific name Casuarina glauca. Plant forest oak, native name Baruda, scientific name Casuarina tortillosa. Plant Morton Bay fig, Native name Goan Ga, scientific name Ficus macrophylla. Plant small fig, native name Yuta, scientific name Ficus platypoda. Plant apple tree, native name Bupu, scientific name Angophora intermedia. Plant rosewood, native name Bunuro, scientific name Acacia glaucescens. Plant dogwood, native name Denner, scientific name Jacksonia scoparis. Plant corkwood or bat tree, native name Kuntan, scientific name Erythrin scoparis. Plant mangrove, native name Tinchi, scientific name Brugiera radii. Plant large honeysuckle, native name Bombara, scientific name Banksia latifolia. Plant small honeysuckle, native name minty, plant Banksia amula. Plant jibang, native name dulandella, scientific name persunia. Plant bedfruit, native name winam, scientific name pandanus pedunculatus. Plant stinging tree, native name bragain, scientific name laportius sp. Plant grass trees, Native name Dacobin, scientific name Xantharia. Plant cabbage tree palm, native name Binca, scientific name Levisterna australis. Plant common palm, native name Piki, scientific name Alcotona phoenix cunninghami. Plant wattle black, native name Kagakal, scientific name Acacia cunninghami. Plant scrub vine, native name Nanum, scientific name Malaysia tortuosa. Plant lawyer cane, native name Tigum, scientific name Calamus speak. Plant lawyer cane bribe dialect, native name Yini. Plant vine with yellow berries, native name Barra, scientific name Codrania javanensis. Plant scrub vine used for climbing. Native name Ural, Ural Creek on Stradbroke, evidently the same name. Scientific name Fragilaria indica. 
plant coarse grass used for deli making, native name Didi, scientific name Cerotes longifolia, plant swamp plant used for fish poison, native name Tangul, scientific name Polygonum hydropiper, plant Conjevoi, native name Bundal, scientific name Alocasia macrorhiza, plant large bean and scrub, native name Yukam, scientific name Canavalia obtusifolia, plant swamp fern, native name Bungwal, scientific name Blechnum cerulatum, plant bulrush, native name Yimbun, scientific name Tipa augustifolia, plant wild yam, native name Tarm, scientific name Dioscoria transversa, plant ground orchids, native name Chingum, scientific name Caledania carnea, Caledania alba, plant white spotted berry, native name Midium, scientific name Myrtus tenifolia, white's name Sarah Morton, native name Diniba, white's name Catchpenny, native name Guaya, White's name, other black women, native name, Taruchi, Bingi Bingi, Munan Topin. White's name, Bob Clift, native name, Ganginda. White's name, Milbong Jemmy, native name, Yilbong, meaning one eye. White's name, Dundali, native name, Dundali, meaning Wonga Pigeon. White's name, King Sandy, native name, Kawali, native meaning, spilt. White's name, Sam, at Dunwich, native name, Yeridmu, meaning, mouth of native bee's nest. White's name, Coban Tom, native name, Mindy Mindy, or Kutigri. White's name, Diali, native name, Diali, meaning tailorfish. White's name Jimmy, native name Wananga, meaning left it. Other men, Kuta, meaning native honey, Omuri, meaning the breast, Tumbo, meaning maggot, Tulamani, meaning creek court. Turwan, great man, Kipper, Young man, Malara, grown man, Jundal, woman, Pudang, mother, Namul, baby, Naring, son, Bing, father, Yinil, creek or gully, Worrell, creek, Ipswich dialect, Bagor, wood, Bungil, grass, Banyo, Ridge, Bipo, Mountain, Mondo, Ridge, Wide Bay Dialect, Tumba, Mountain, Wide Bay Dialect. Yagga, No, Yawai, Yes, Bigi, Sun, Kilen, Moon, Mirigan, Stars, Karumba, Big, Burpee, Little, Kalanga, Good, Maruchi dialect. Kangangang, laughing jackass. Tungi, native companion. Kundurkan, ditto, Strabrick Island dialect. Wargan, crow. Kongong, egg. Towan, fish. Kidin, mosquito. Dibin, common house fly. Chidna, track of foot. Muru, Nose, Mara, Hand, Mill, Eye, Pidna, Ear, Tambor, Mouth, Tia, Teeth, Magur, Head, Wadli, Bad, Mugara, Thunder, Kanangor, Thirsty, Milan, Plenty, Tugun, Sea Waves, Kiri, North, Yungo, South, Wian, West, Bogin, East, 
Anan Grey Eagle Hawk to Wai Black Eagle Hawk Buddha Eagle Hawk Wide Bay Dialect Talabilla Outlaw Nalankali Liar Mirbong Net for Kangaroo Muntong Net for Paddy Melons Bulla Two Bulla Bulla Four Dalobolpal Camping Place Tabalian Manga Running Water Inta Tabal Balkai You Water Fetch It Mianjin Gata Yarana Brisbane I'm Going Inta Wana Yarana You We're Going Yin Wana Yan Man Same Meaning Wide Bay Dialect End of Section 36 End of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland Dating from 1837 Recorded by his daughter, Constance Campbell Petrie.